Let's welcome in our national columnist, Bill Ryder, and the man who does it all, the one we call Coach Avery Johnson. Thanks for joining us, fellas. It's been reported that Kyrie Irving, if he cannot reach an agreement to stay in Brooklyn, he has a list of teams that he is considering and signing with, and that includes the Lakers, the Clippers, the Knicks, the Heat, the Mavs, and the Sixers. We're going to break down all potential landing spots, but first, Bill, what's the latest you're hearing as far as Kyrie's future goes? Yeah, there's certainly an expectation around the NBA that the uh, disconnect and divide between the Nets and Kyrie Irving, and we really saw the heart of some of that, Sean Marks, who's the GM, coming out and being pretty candid about what they want and describing a player who certainly was not Kyrie Irving over the last 12 months. So the question becomes a, a couple things. Will the Nets be willing to facilitate Kyrie's exit that would require that he opt in and then they operate a sign-and-trade? If not... It's very difficult unless Kyrie Irving takes a huge pay cut to go to any of the teams he's put on that reported list of places he'd like to play. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned it there. None of those teams have cap space to sign him without the Nets' help. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But regardless, let's look at each of the landing spots and see how he could potentially fit into those systems. So we're going to start with the Lakers. And Avery, what do you think? How could he fit in in L.A.? Well, he would fit in if Russell Westbrook wasn't on the roster because I don't think Russell Westbrook wants to be a backup. And if Kyrie Irving is signed, I don't see them starting in the backcourt together. Um, so I would say, where where is Westbrook going to land in some sort of a signing trade? And who's going to take that contract? But mine is Westbrook. Uh, if Kyrie Irving lands in L.A., it's just like bringing back old times, even though LeBron James is older when you have an opportunity to roll out Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, even at this stage of his career, and a healthy Anthony Davis, you know, mixed in with some other younger players, hopefully they'll re-sign Malik Monk, uh, then they have a chance to get back at least in the playoff hunt. That still doesn't necessarily make them a championship team unless I can see that Anthony Davis is going to be available uh, at a high level great because if it's just Kyrie and LeBron James, I don't think they can knock off any of the top four teams, whether it's Memphis, Dallas, Golden State, Phoenix, and in the Western Conference. So it's going to depend on Anthony Davis' health. I know LeBron's been tweeting about it, talking about watch out, you know, stay tuned. Anthony Davis is going to have a breakout season. I need to see it. But if Kyrie Irving is there minus Westbrook with those two guys, and Anthony Davis is healthy, I can see them becoming more of a pretender and not necessarily a contender. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm in the camp, guys, of, of those folks who are skeptical that wherever Kyrie Irving goes, he's going to be effective. And there's certainly a divide, a, a stark divide around the NBA. GMs and front office folks who think Kyrie and his presence is it, a no-brainer and those who think it's a no-brainer not to bring him in. But I do think the Lakers, if they could facilitate this, would be a good fit. We've seen what Kyrie Irving can do with LeBron James, but, but Coach is right. This is a vastly difficult thing to pull off. And I did talk to a couple Lakers sources today. They'd like him to be there. They'd like to make it work. But there's really only three realistic ways that this happens. One, and Coach hit on this, you, you got to get Russell Westbrook off the books. Good luck with that. That feels like a near impossibility. Now, it doesn't mean it can happen. Highly unlikely. Number two, trade Anthony Davis as part of a deal that, that brings in Kyrie Irving. That is not something the Lakers are interested in. As I understand it, it seems highly unlikely. And then number three, maybe this is the most realistic situation, is that Kyrie Irving would have to agree to take a, a massive pay cut to be a Los Angeles Laker. Right now, they have the mid-level exception if he really wants to play with LeBron James. But one of the two sources I visited with from the Lakers told me they find it highly unlikely Kyrie would do that. This source was skeptical the other two scenarios could play, play out. So they thought best-case scenario, 10% chance that Kyrie Irving actually is a Laker next year, but the Lakers certainly are dreaming, daydreaming, I think, that this could be something they could try to facilitate. All right, so you're saying 10% chance that he ends up in L.A. So what about the next spot? We're going to talk about Miami next. The Heat, they could have, you know, some, some players that might make some sort of attractive trade package that they could send Brooklyn's way. What do you think, Avery? Yeah, I think this is another possibility, but, and especially with a guy like Kyle Lowry, who was basically a shell of himself throughout the playoffs. You know, he looked overweight. He was two or three steps slow, just couldn't stay healthy in and out of games uh, for Miami. And you got to give Pat Riley credit. He always finds a way to pull off these type of a trade 
uh, signing trades in this situation. So, uh, you know, you got Tyler Hero who could be an attractive. Uh, but at the end of the day, what can the Nets get back that's going to keep Kevin Durant in a Nets uniform? That's going to be the biggest key. Because if they can't get enough back where they could be a viable championship team, then uh, Kevin Durant, and I know we're going to talk about this later, I think he's going to want to also exit stage left. But sure, Miami could be a really good landing spot playing alongside Jimmy Butler. But then how much are they going to lose? Do they have to include Bam Adebayo in a trade to get Kyrie Irving? If they do, I don't see Miami facilitating this trade. Yeah, Jenny, I think you're right. This this is one that feels a lot more realistic just in terms of the pieces that have to be moved. And Coach is right. that There are some parts that you can send out that might be enough of an enticement to convince Brooklyn to, to play ball and allow Kyrie Irving, again, to opt into this final year of his deal and then be part of a sign-and-trade to send him to Miami. And we know that Jimmy Butler has been pretty vocal over the years, whether it's on talk shows at night or on Twitter, that Kyrie is a player he's wanted to play with. He once called him the player he admires most in the NBA, who's not Jimmy Butler. So from a culture perspective with the players, and from a fit in terms of the pieces to just make the numbers work, it certainly is something that makes sense. And I, I suppose I should throw in that Pat Riley has always gone big game hunting, is not afraid to bring in massive talent. I'll, I'll just say this, and not that he wouldn't do it despite what I'm about to point out, but the Miami Heat have a very unique culture uh, of defense, uh, of practicing, pretty aggressively, especially by modern NBA standards of, and I'm not trying to make light of Kyrie Irving's situation, but showing up for work, it, it's not a great fit in terms of the Heat way and the Kyrie Irving way. Now, when you're enticed by talent, when you're Kyrie Irving, you're enticed by the idea of playing with Jimmy Butler and being Miami, maybe those are problems you deal with if and when it happens, but there are pieces that can make this happen. And for folks around the NBA, Miami is an intriguing perspective or an intriguing organization if you really believe that Kyrie Irving is going to ha get some help from the Brooklyn Nets in sending him out as part of a sign-in trade. It is interesting to think about that the work mentality that would have to go into playing in Miami. And obviously, these guys have an incredible work ethic. But going into the past issues that Irving's had, you never know if it would match up there. What about a team like the Mavericks looking you know, to build off that run that they just had to the Western Conference Finals? Do you think that you know, Irving could be added to that plan, Avery? I, I don't see this happening. Uh, one, because I think Jalen Brunson, uh, who they would need to include in the signing trade, I think he has his sights on going to another team uh, in New York. Uh, and it's not, it's not the Brooklyn Nets <laughs> that, that rides in the Brooklyn borough. So I, I don't see this happening. Um, sure, it would be a phenomenal fit. Uh, it would be a coup for Mark Cuban. I think if Kyrie was playing alongside Luka Doncic the way he can play on and off the ball. He takes them to an entirely different level, especially, you know, he's won a championship. He knows what it's like to make deep playoff runs. And this could pretty much catapult them potentially in that Golden State Warriors uh, uh, spectrum of teams. But um, as much as Mark Cuban would love my former boss for this to happen, I just don't see the necessary pieces that needs to participate to make this happen because I don't think Kevin Durant getting Tim Hardaway Jr. back, which could also make this a potentially sign and trade work. I don't think that'll do anything for Kevin Durant to maybe encourage him to stay with the Nets. Yeah, I think Coach is 100% right. There, Dallas does not have the pieces that need to come back, I think, just to satiate the frustration and anger the Brooklyn Nets feel. I mean, they may do business to help Kyrie Irving, but that business will be done if they do it to, to really help the Brooklyn Nets. And as Coach pointed out, bringing enough pieces to have something you can compete with so that Kevin Durant sticks around and your organization doesn't go from a contender to an absolute train wreck is it, a critical part of this. Dallas does not have the pieces that, that you can send. I, I'm highly skeptical. And I think Kyrie Irving will be dealt, and I think he will go somewhere else. And I, and I do think, from what I've heard, there's certainly a sense that Brooklyn – will facilitate a sign and trade because they need to get something in return. They're, they're between a rock and a hard place. I, I don't think that will be the Dallas Mavericks. What about this last spot we're going to talk about? Just a nice hop, skip, and a jump across town. The New York Knicks. The Knicks really emerged as one of the first potential landing spots for Irving when this all kind of first get, started getting talked about. Avery, could you see it? I don't think this one is out of the question. I think, you know, this was a situation where Kyrie obviously – considered the Knicks, and I think he was really high on his list, 
before Kevin Durant decided that he was going to go to Brooklyn. And if Kevin Durant wanted to go and join the uh, New York Knicks, Kyrie Irving would be in the Knicks uniform. So I don't think this is out of the question. I know guys like Spike Lee was <laughs> upset last night uh, on, on the draft night coverage, but the Knicks were basically clearing out space. They didn't want to take any young players in the draft that couldn't help them catapult themselves back into the playoffs. So I, I think this is a possibility, but again, it also remains to be seen, you know, could it be a guy like Kyrie Irving and you can get a Donovan Mitchell who the Knicks are very high on to join him. But so I don't think this one is out of the question, but yeah, if Kyrie Irving decides to join the, the Knicks, I think this is really going to give uh, Kevin Durant a migraine headache for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, this is the catch-22 of talking about Kyrie Irving. I don't know that Kyrie Irving knows what, he, what he's going to do day-to-day, and certainly the people around him don't. So it's hard for, for Coach and I to, to speculate, but, but I'll speculate right, right, along, right along with Coach. I, I agree. I think the Knicks are, are, are a realistic possibility – and it comes down to, again, what Kyrie Irving's willing to do in terms of taking less money. But we're not talking $6 million or $10 million a year, some mid-level exception number. The Knicks did clear space. They did clear about $9 million per year and get rid of Kemba Walker, that contract and that trade uh, where Kemba went to Detroit. So there is a situation here, and there are more contracts. There are more guys, about three or four on the Knicks team that folks around the NBA think the Knicks could move on from and create some more space that would allow New York to be able to make maybe not a max offer for Kyrie Irving, but something that's a lot more generous than what Kyrie would have to do to go to a place like Los Angeles. We know that James Dolan has always been intrigued by winning the press conference and getting the big name, whether that works or it doesn't work. It hasn't worked over the years, obviously. But I think the Knicks are a real – it's hard to know if Kyrie Irving wants to be a New York Knick, but if he does, the Knicks have a lot more freedom to try and put together some kind of enticing package that may not require the assistance of the Brooklyn Nets and that gives them a huge advantage if the reports are true that this is a place Kyrie's actually interested in. All right, Avery, now this is your moment. I know you've been itching to talk about this. Kevin Durant obviously said he's he's weighing his options. Reportedly, he hasn't told the Nets that he would leave if Kyrie gets traded or if, he, if that ends up happening. But there's a lot of questions surrounding what would happen with KD. So what do you make of this all, Avery? Well, if Kyrie Irving is not going to be in a – in a Brooklyn Nets uniform, there's no way that Kevin Durant stays around for some sort of a, a rebuild. He didn't sign up for this. This guy, you know, had an opportunity. He could have stayed with the Golden State Warriors and he'd have a another uh, championship uh, ring. But he wanted to go out. He wanted to lead a team of his own, just same way he led the Golden State Warriors. This idea that Kevin Durant wasn't the bus driver for the Golden State Warriors that I've heard from certain analysts, he was the bus driver. Go back and look at his numbers in both of those uh, fine championship uh, NBA finals. So I, But I think in this situation, Kevin Durant wants to further cement his illustrious career. And if Kyrie Irving is not going to be around, his buddy James Harden already forced his way out of uh, Brooklyn to Philadelphia because Kyrie refused to get the uh, vaccination during the COVID protocols, I don't see Kevin Durant sticking around for a rebuild. Yeah, I'm with Coach. And I think the Miami Heat would be a really interesting place to, to keep an eye on. Let, let me use this as an opportunity to tell a, a quick story. I was with a with an Eastern Conference GM at the start of the season, and we were just shooting the breeze and gossiping. And I brought up Kyrie Irving. And this GM must have spent five minutes giving me a breakdown of all the things he thought were wrong with Kyrie Irving on and off the floor in terms of this is before obviously Kyrie and the didn't show up in the entirety of the season. Just he walked me through what was a laundry list of reasons to stay away from Kyrie Irving. So I said to him, oh, so you'd you wouldn't sign him. You wouldn't bring him in here if you had the chance. And he leaned back, made a face and said, oh, no, I'd, I'd bring him in. He's, he's too talented. This should be a warning to every GM of every organization we've just discussed. I think about bringing in Kyrie Irving. Because we're discussing now that if Kyrie leaves, if he doesn't opt into this deal, if he doesn't do what he said he was going to do when he said he wanted to return to Brooklyn, the Nets are an absolute dumpster fire. Because Coach is right. Kevin Durant's going to try to go play somewhere else. All the pieces they moved for James Harden and for Kyrie Irving, all these really, I think, impressive pieces that were part of a rebuild that was working are playing somewhere else. We don't know what Ben Simmons is ever going to be. And I think this is the danger you run with Kyrie Irving when you build around this guy. Because Coach is right, if Kyrie leaves, and it certainly sounds like he's going to, 
if, if he doesn't leverage the Nets to make some sort of U-turn, maybe they will, Kevin Durant is going to look for greener pastures. And I think it's a reminder that talent's great, but you want talented players who are not going to burn your organization to the ground. So, Bill, I want to expand on that real quick. So, so say it does happen. KD and Kyrie are out. What does this mean for the Nets and their rebuild? What do they do? I mean, yeah. Uh, what it means is a really long couple nights for Sean Marks. And I think it's not a start. They're not starting over because the irony here, and I think the, the catch-22, is that the Brooklyn Nets and the organization, the front office that's in place now, inherited one of the most difficult rebuilds, maybe in basketball history. When you go back to that trade, back when they were in Jersey with the Celtics that left them totally without draft picks of any substance for a really long time. Now, it, it, it's a market that's shown that it can be attractive. It, it's a market that's shown that it can be successful. So they certainly, I think, have some success in free agency down the road. They have a vision they can sell. But a lot of the pieces that they needed, a lot of the guys that were Karis LeVert and other names like that are no longer there. And so it would it would go from a rebuild on the run if Kevin, Kevin Durant stuck, stuck around to an absolute rebuild. And that's two or three years. You have to do it right. You have to draft properly. You have to make moves. It, they would go from being a contender to an absolute disaster overnight. Coach, you've been there, former head coach of the Nets there. Are you glad you don't have to deal with all of this right now? Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't trade my seat for anything. <laughs> and I think Steve Nash is going to want to trade his seat because I, I think at the end of the day, if they have to rebuild, this is not what Steve Nash signed up for. Remember, they were trying to recreate what the Golden State Warriors did by bringing in Steve Kerr with no head coaching experience. You know, he takes over for Mark Jackson and obviously has gone on and put in the work and while he's been successful. They tried to recreate that wheel with Steve Nash and it's just basically going the opposite direction for a variety of, of reasons. So I think at the end of the day, I, I somewhat disagree with my buddy Bill. I think if Kevin Durant leaves, and follows Kyrie Irving out of the door. This is an absolute rebuild. And I think it's gonna take more than two years. They don't have enough infrastructure. What, what Cam Thomas, you know, Blake Griffin. No, they're gonna be a bottom feeder. This team will be one of the worst teams, probably one of the worst two or three teams in the Eastern Conference. Uh, they can't even make it through a playing game. Uh, uh, our first conference, series against uh, get, getting swept by the Boston Celtics. So I think they completely go the opposite direction. And then you have to question whether Steve Nash wants to stay around for this rebuild. Well, Avery, we're certainly glad that you're, you're on this side with us. Bill, always a pleasure, but you two don't go anywhere. We got lots more to chat about. We're going to continue this NBA discussion as we take a look at some off-season dates. So obviously the draft took place last night. Next up, free agency begins on June 30th. And then, of course, we have the Vegas Summer League taking place July 7th through the 17th. And sometime in September, training camps begin, so it's not so far away. Draft night for the New York Knicks. Who could put that into words? They were by far the busiest team in the 2022 draft. We're talking about three separate trades that had players and picks just all over the place. Now, we tried to make this as easy as possible to understand. So here we go. All right. First up, the Knicks had the number 11 pick entering the night. There was a lot of talk about them potentially moving up. Instead, they decided to trade out of the first round by sending that pick to the Oklahoma City Thunder in exchange for three future first rounders. Then we move on to the next one. Shortly after completing the deal with the Thunder, the Knicks, they got back on the phone. They worked out a trade with the Charlotte Hornets. They took the 2023 first round via Denver, then got in the Thunder trade and packaged it with four future second rounders for the 13th overall pick. All right, moving on. Finally, the Knicks then flipped the 13th pick, which is Jalen Duren and Kemba Walker to Detroit, Pistons in the third deal. In return, the Knicks got a 2025 first rounder, a pick from Milwaukee, uh, which the Pistons had previously acquired in the Jeremy Grant trade earlier this week. So you see the final haul here kind of breaks it all down. The Knicks closed the night with three future first round picks, some extra cap space. It's 18 million to be exact. So you got all of that? Nice and easy, right? Yeah. All right. Let's welcome back Bill Ryder and Avery Johnson. Now that all the dust has settled on the craziness of the Knicks that, that put us through last night, I mean, it was just all over the place. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at the moves that they made. So, Bill, how did they set themselves up for success in the future? 
these words are strange, but I actually think the Knicks might have done something smart on, on draft night. They they were they allowed themselves to make some selections down the road, as you just pointed out, including several first round picks next year, and they created a lot of cap space. So the question becomes, as it always does with New York, is do they use the cap space properly? It's great to have cap space. You have to use it in a way that's smart, bring in the right people, fit it with the right guys that you draft. You have to draft properly. But the Knicks are able to take a situation where they can go out and make a run. We discussed earlier Kyrie Irving or other free agents down the road or Jalen Brunson. And those picks, if it's a big if, if they draft properly in 2023 and 2025, that all of a sudden turns an organization that I think is behind guys into one that could have a lot of depth even 12 months from now. Avery, how about some free agents the Knicks could and should realistically target? Well, there's one guy that I think has been on the Knicks' mind um, the entire season, and they strategically made a move when they hired Rick Brunson, the (laughs) dad of Jalen Brunson. Uh, It's kind of like something that college coaches would do when they're trying to sign a five-star type of of, uh, player. So uh, I think this is a guy that they've zeroed in on. Uh, They think he's a game changer. He's a true point guard. Uh, You know, he's a two-time NCAA champion. He helped elevate the Mavericks when Luka Doncic was out uh, in that first round against the Utah Jazz. You know, this guy makes big shots. They think he can complement what they have. You know, guys like uh, Barrett, uh, Julius Randle, obviously, you know, they want to get the ball out of his hands a little bit more. And he's he's just a Northeast guy, you know, played ball at Villanova, Philadelphia. Knicks fans are very familiar with him. You know, he's played a lot of the Big East tournaments uh, in Madison Square Garden. So they feel that he has the DNA of the type of Nick player that they want to move forward with. So the New York Knicks, if they can land J- Jalen Brunson, even though Mark Cuban can pay him more, uh, they would be uh, thrilled to death. Get him in the Northeast. Just a good old Northeast guy. That's what I like to hear. All right, for the Bulls, it's expected that they will sign Zach Levine, but the Lakers, Trailblazers, Spurs, Mavericks are also said to be interested. So, Bill, what do you think of Chicago's pursuit here? And if it isn't Chicago, best landing spots for him? It feels like at this point that it should feel like it's a lock that Zach Levine is is coming back. They want to pay him. They built their, their team and their process around the idea of giving him a max deal. And it's a really interesting and good basketball team, especially when everybody is healthy. And the fact that he has not said that he's coming back, that there is some uncertainty, that there are certainly some some rising signals at places like San Antonio and Portland that, that have money and Dallas and Miami that have ambitions, if not the same cap space, feel a middling level of confidence they can land. Zach Levine has folks that I've talked to around the NBA thinking that that there's a possibility he, he goes somewhere else. And a lot like with Bradley Beal, It's just a giant question mark, a lot like the draft last night, where usually at this point we know what's going on and people around the NBA know what's going on. And just like last night, who was going to go number one overall, there's a lot of uncertainty about what Zach Levine wants to do and optimism in places that aren't Chicago that they may be able to make a run in. Also, you mentioned right there, inserted D, when it comes to a player like Bradley Beal, it seems like, you know, he might decline his player option. That means he would enter free agency after a 10-year career with the Wizards. So, Avery, what do you see happening with Beal? Well, first, let me just say this. I agree with Bill on Zach, with Zach Levine. Chicago can pay him the most money, but I really believe in his heart he wants to be a Laker. He wants to go and play with LeBron James, learn from LeBron James. Sure, he had an incredible run this year with DeMar DeRozan, but DeMar DeRozan is not LeBron James. So we'll see what happens. But Bradley Bill, I think Miami is the uh, perfect landing spot for him. Um, I, I believe especially with the situation and the health of Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry broke down at the end of the season. It put a tremendous amount of pressure on uh, uh, Jimmy Butler. And Tyler Hero had some issues with injuries. And when he tried to play in that game seven, he just wasn't the same player. But you bring in a veteran like Bradley Beal, it's similar to, I believe, when Jimmy Butler wasn't re-signed with, uh, with Philadelphia. And he went to Miami. Miami's got that discipline. They have the culture. They have the coaching. Uh, you know, Eric Spolster, championship coach. Um, I, I think they have the infrastructure that can really help Bradley Beal and give him his best chance of winning an NBA title. Avery, I, I couldn't agree more. Let me just go. Go oh, for sorry. it. Sorry, let me just real. I got all excited. It's such a good point. 
I'll just add, unlike Kyrie Irving, who we discussed earlier, Bradley Beal is universally regarded as a great guy, a great locker room guy, a great culture guy, a great player. I'm with Coach. If he decides he's open to being somewhere other than Washington, the Miami Heat aren't just a great fit for him. He's a great fit for the Miami Heat. Listen, we were trying to speed this up. You guys just have so much information. You want to keep it coming, but we'll let you go now. Thank you so much for joining us on this hour, CBS Sports HQ, fellas. We got a lot of interesting moments coming up in the NBA. Here's a list of those prominent names that could be some highly sought after fellas after a week from now or so. You see James Harden, of course, at the top of that list. And Levine, everyone's saying Levine, coach likes him potentially going to the Lakers. Who knows, unrestricted free agent. That's coming up. You mentioned Harden there, DeAndre A and Bradley Beal, both, both coach and Avery, big fans, Avery and Bill, excuse me, both big fans of him potentially going to Miami. This is CBS Sports HQ. The NBA draft had a number of surprises for us last night. An unpredictable top three, a few trades that caught the eye and made teams better, and lots of tears as dreams come true for players and their families, and some uh, fashion statements as well. And the odds are good. We'll see these picks on the court. This past season, all first-round picks from the 2021 draft featured in at least one game. All right, in terms of draft grades, our Colin Ward-Henninger and Kyle Boone were up until the wee hours of the morning. Grading the teams after the draft, here are the notable grades. You can see the full report card with analysis over on CBSSports.com. Now let's bring in one of the authors of said article, Colin Ward-Henninger, who has yet to get some sleep. I mean, he had a little bit of sleep earlier in the day, but uh, between uh, noon and now, Colin uh, has simply been doing stretching and some exercises. Uh, Colin, we spoke earlier today about draft fits for some of these picks, players who fit the system that they've been drafted into, but now let's talk about these grades. First, what parameters did you use to grade the teams and the picks? Yeah, basically what you're looking at is, one, was that the right player in the right spot? Did you overdraft? Uh, two, did you get a player who has upside, who has some potential? And three, did you get a player that fit what you needed? So ultimately, if you're looking at a, at a draft in its totality, you know, you're not just looking at one pick, you're not just looking at another pick. You're saying, what did this team do on draft night to improve their team? You look at the totality of those picks and then you decide, you know, uh, did they help or did they hurt or did they basically fall flat? And there were a few teams that clearly improved their stock, a few others who, you know, could have done better in their position. So really that's what you're looking at when you're trying to evaluate a draft. Obviously, we don't know whether these picks are going to pan out, but based on the evaluations that we have, the educated guesses that we have, we try to figure out who improved and who probably, you know, hurt themselves a little bit. Okay, so let's go through some of these. We start with the Pelicans. They received one of the top grades in the draft. Take us through why they were so successful. Yeah, I think the Pelicans uh, hit an absolute home run here. A-plus grade. They added to their team in ways that are not only going to help them in the future, but they're going to help them next season. Dyson Daniels is a tremendous point guard prospect. He's huge. He's 6'8". He's strong. He is a defensive-minded prospect, which is something that the Pelicans need at that position. They tried out Devontae Graham and guys like that last year. Didn't really work out. So now, you know, Daniels might even be able to slot into the starting lineup immediately given his maturity coming out of the G League Ignite program. Uh, he's also a ball mover. He's not necessarily uh, a guy who's going to go out there and run 500 pick and rolls. Uh, but he can certainly keep the ball moving, get the ball to the scorers. The Pelicans have enough offense around him. They don't need him to do too much. And then they were also able to pick up EJ Liddell in the second round. This is a guy who was rated as a top 20 prospect on some people's boards. Uh, their forwards, their centers, you know, Jonas Valanciunas, Jackson Hayes, Larry Nance, they can't really shoot. So getting a guy like EJ Liddell who can step out, knock down a jumper, a uh, tremendous defensive player with blocks and steals, uh, I think the Pelicans just added to their arsenal and, and really are ready to build off of what was a great end to the season last year. All right, the universe smiling on the Pistons. Detroit likely shocked to see Jaden Ivey fall to them at five. I mean, easy pick there. How did their picks address their glaring needs? Yeah, like you said, I, I, a gift from the heavens that Jaden Ivey fell into their lap. Uh, I'm sure they had him circled on their draft board. 
just because of the way that he fits with Cade Cunningham. We know how great Cade Cunningham can be and look towards the end of last season, uh, but he's more of a facilitator. He's not necessarily a guy that's going to go out you go out there and get you 30 every single night. Jaden Ivey is that type of guy. So if you put him next to Cade Cunningham, uh, that creates a, an absolutely dynamic combination that is going to terrorize this league for years to come. They also got much more athletic by going out and getting Jalen Duran. Uh, this is a guy who, who has a 7'5 wingspan, can jump out of the gym, will catch lobs, will run out in transition. Also a defensive prospect. Uh, he wasn't the greatest defender in college. But you know he can block shots with that wingspan and he has the mobility potentially to be a switch defender so i think in adding ivy and duran they got extremely athletic uh they are perfect pieces to put next to Cade cunningham so the pistons are really setting themselves up to be good four or five years down the road yeah we see the pistons getting that a plus grade uh from you guys all right charlotte had an active night you saw jalen duran there i mean they drafted him then traded him to the pistons so mark williams addresses a need for them though talk us through the grade that you gave them yeah mark williams you know jalen duran would have done a similar thing but he got traded to two teams in five minutes uh but they ended up with williams who is just an absolute beast right uh this is a charlotte team that has needed a center for a very long time uh, you put him in the middle next to Lamelo ball running those pick and rolls throwing lobs uh, he's seven feet tall, seven seven wingspan, uh, throws down ferocious dunks if you ever watched him in college. So to get a guy like that who can defend the rim on one hand with his, uh, his shot blocking ability, and then on the other end, be able to catch lobs and be in that dunker spot for pick and rolls. This is something that Charlotte has craved for a long time. They were looking, you know, for uh, yeah, some center help with Miles Turner and guys like that. I don't think they're going to need that now. I think Williams is a guy who a few years ago might have gone in the top five of the draft given his skill set, but because how the center position has been devalued, uh, they were able to snag him at 15. So I think this is a huge pickup uh, for the Charlotte Hornets. And that's why I ended up giving them such a good grade. Yeah, they get an A- minus uh, from you and Kyle Boone. Lastly, uh, let's talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. While some teams are building for the future, teams like the Bucks are in their title winning window. And the pieces they added reflect that, don't they, Colin? Yeah, they do. They went for, you know, an older prospect in Marjon Bochamp. A lot of people think that, that he's younger because he played for the G League Ignite. He'll actually be 22 years old by the time the season starts. So uh, right immediately being able to slot into a team with championship aspirations. Uh, what I love most about Bochamp is his grittiness, his toughness. He didn't have an easy road. He played at some junior colleges, thought about giving up on the game for a while. If you watched him during the draft, after he got picked, he was in tears. He was bawling. He was so happy. This is a guy going to a team with Giannis Antetokounmpo, who has never been given anything in his life. He's had to scrap Chris Middleton, a second round pick. Drew Holiday has been undervalued his entire career. Uh, Bochamp can slot in right on the wing. He's not the greatest shooter, but he's going to play hard. He's going to get out in transition and he's going to defend with the ability, you know, potential to grow into something bigger. So um, I really love what the Bucks did there with their, their 24th pick. There weren't a lot of options for them. You see other teams trading out of spots like that, but they decided to go with Bochamp, and I think that was the right pick. Getting a B-plus from you guys. He is CBS Sports basketball writer Colin Ward-Henninger, who has, was up until 6 a.m. this morning uh, doing draft grades and analysis. Colin, we love you. We appreciate you. Go get some rest. Let's recap Colin and Kyle's top 10 draft grades in terms of the teams that fulfilled their needs the most in the draft. Pelicans with Dyson Daniels, Pistons getting Jaden Ivey. The full list with analysis and breakdown grades available over on CBSSports.com. The 2022 NBA draft had a few surprises for us Thursday night. One of those coming right off the top with the selection of Paulo Boncaro first overall. Now, Boncaro wasn't the favorite to be selected first by Orlando, so those who got him at that plus number, ooh, they love turning that ticket in. Our Gary Parrish calls Boncaro the most impactful player of the draft class and an incredible building block. For the Orlando Magic, he's already listed at plus 350 to win Rookie of the Year. He and Jabari Smith Jr., both at 350, by the way. Jabari Smith was the favorite going into the day. After that, Jaden Ivey, Chet Holmgren, sitting at plus 550. Keegan Murray at plus 900. And then the Canadian, Ben Matherin, sitting at 10 to 1. All right, let's talk about those Rookie of the Year odds with our guy, Tim Doyle. I mean, he was in the studio yesterday. 
Oh, he's back home in his parents' basement uh, here to join us here on HQ. Tim, it's always good to see you. Uh, let's talk about Boncaro plus 350 to start after he goes to Orlando. Are you buying those odds? You're shaking your head there. You know, I wasn't buying him as a top three pick. So how can I possibly buy his odds as rookie of the year? Like, when you're projecting out and looking at a player where they're going to be in two or three years, because, you know, that's you want to see, like, glimpses in year one, and then you're going to see the progression as the years go on. I'm not buying it. I, I don't know. Like, if I was Orlando, I would have had so many other options. I think, obviously, you see 6'10 and a half, see so the ball on the floor, you can see you can shoot. But it was certainly a roller coaster ride there at Duke, up and down, game after game. Oh, and by the way, Jeremy, he played with uh, some pretty good players there at Duke. Check out all the Duke players that were drafted in the first round. So, you know, that also helps. Uh, there's no doubt the guy has talent, but I think he has to come a very long way. And overall, if you look at this squad right now, you see Jalen Suggs there. I was convinced it was going to be Chet Holman. I mean, high school with Suggs, went to the same college as Suggs. Uh, Cole Anthony's on that roster. I mean, when you look, uh, there's the old Franz Wagner. Um, they're bad, the Magic. So you're going to be able to play a lot. And I just think he has to figure out who he is, Bancaro as far as a basketball player. I, I don't really know. He can do a little bit of everything, no doubt about it. I think he's going to be in the NBA a very long time. But um, favorite to win rookie of the year? No, thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so then Jabari Smith right there with him at that number. Are you buying in on Smith? I mean, he was the guy that we thought was going to be number one. Yeah, I, I'm excited about Jabari Smith. You know, I've been pretty hard on the Houston Rockets because their young talent is... Well, let's just call, let's call them young. All right? I'm not going to say the word immature. Okay, They're immature. And I think they're finding how to dance with one another. But Kevin Porter Jr. is an amazing talent. And Jalen Green can jump like in the hoop. And that's just one of the attributes that he has. So now you bring in a Jabari Smith who could certainly shoot it from deep. The comparisons are Kevin Durant. I don't know about you, Jeremy, but when you start throwing the old KD out there, that's a pretty high praise. So this kid has a world of talent. Uh, he's got an amazing touch. He shot over 40% from three. He's the most threes ever made by a freshman at Auburn last year. And it's coming from a guy who, you, know, you just look at his body and you're like, whoa, this guy has amazing chance to grow. He's got a tremendous wingspan, great timing. Uh, Houston is just an interesting spot because the talent is there, but everybody is kind of learning their individual role. Uh, three and a half to one. I don't think it's terrible odds. I think he, that he's going to have a tremendous opportunity because Houston, like the Magic, oh, they're bad. They're real bad, Jeremy, so he's going to get a chance to play. Yeah, they're some of the longest odds in terms of winning the NBA title for next season. Uh, you mentioned Chet Holmgren. I mean, in all of our HQ mock drafts that we did, except for the final one, I mean, Chet Holmgren was the guy that was going first overall. So he goes second to the Thunder. His rookie odds, the worst of this top trio at plus 550. What do you think of that pricing? Yeah, you know, I, I like the value there because the linchpin right now of OKC is Josh Giddy. And what's his best attribute? Passing. He makes other guys better on the floor. His basketball IQ, I believe Giddy's is going to be on the LeBron, Luka Doncic era. I'm not saying he's going to be the same player basketball IQ-wise, like a Steve Nash, like a Jason Kidd. Those guys made everybody else better around them. He's going to put Chet in a position to win. Here's where we could start with Chet winning. The outfit. The outfit and the haircut need a major upgrade. I don't know what the heck he was doing. I get that he's a teenager, but Jeremy, send him to the guy who cuts your hair down there that won't let you let you dye it. Send him to your outfit guy. I'll get him a custom suit. What do you think of the draft night outfit out of Chet? I mean, you know, you got to have your own style. I I applaud a guy having his own style, Tim. You got to, you know, you got to you got to make a statement and show some personality, right? I mean, come on. His his style has a very long way to go. His style has a longer way to go than his actual game. <laughs> I like the fit here because you look at OKC, I talked about Giddy, but then they have SGA and then they have the old Lou Dort who could play both ways. Um, I'm excited about OKC. You know, they beat the Lakers twice. You know, are they going to win 40 games? No, but I like the pieces that they have around them. And when, you know, you're one of your best players and Giddy's your most unselfish player, and that rubs off on everybody else. And I, I, I like what Presti is building here. I don't think it's going to be the old Jimmy Harden, Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant. But I do think that this is a team that, let's just say when they play the Grizzlies in two years in the first round, they're going to give them a heck of a series in like that 1-8 type of game. So 
I'm excited about Holmgren going there. I think there's a really good fit. I think this would have been a great fit for any of these guys because of the way they move the basketball OKC. So I'm excited about Holmgren. I'm going to take a flyer here. Also at a plus 550, Jaden Ivey, who fell to the Pistons at number five. I mean, talk about a gift. When you look at them in comparison to each other, who's the better value play when you look at both him and Holmgren? I, I think that Ivy has uh, a bigger upside than everybody. I think that he has the potential to be a superstar. You know, I don't think Paolo Bancaro is going to be a superstar. And I don't know if Jaden Ivey is going to be, but I think he has more potential to be. You understand what I mean? Like, I think that he could actually get so much better than Bancaro. But here's why I'm not going to go with Ivy here. Who's in Detroit? Ah, uh, Kate Cunningham. The guy's pretty good, and he controls the basketball a lot. So they're going to be figuring out how to dance with one another on the floor when it's your time to go, when it's my time to go. But, you know, the comparisons that I made to Ivy was John Morant. And, you know, interesting with these two guys, I think the Pistons are a playoff team next year. I repeat, the Pistons wow. are a playoff team next year year okay if healthy you gotta put the parentheses out there and put if healthy because i think kate cunningham is an mvp type level player i think we did not see that last year why he didn't play in the preseason i don't care who you are you play one year of college no preseason nba and they just like throw you out there you know there was a stretch last year and i know this isn't wins and losses okay but it's the spread and vegas is pretty smart the pistons went 21 and 2 ats against the spread so you were plus, I don't know, 19 bets. Pretty easy math to figure out if you were betting the Pistons. That, to me, that they shows me that they have some chemistry. And they're okay with saying goodbye to Jeremy Grant, who averages nearly 20 points a game because Kate Cunningham is that big of a superstar. Saying all of that, excited about the Pistons, just not sure how much Ivy is going to touch the ball. But if they're going to win, you know, it kind of gets back to the Evan Mobley factor. You know, you get him back into the playoffs like he did with the Cavaliers. He's going to get a lot of love. So you want to play Jaden Ivey? I get it. Uh, Tim, Canadian Ben Matherin, 10-1, to 1, goes 6 to the Pacers. Now, you know I'm always cheering on the Canadians. But should I be betting on him? I, I think that he's my sleeper pick. I think this is Bradley Beal 2.0. He's 6'6", six, gave you 18 points a game. More importantly, almost six rebounds. Can guard multiple positions. And I will say this, all right, and I'm not just saying this because the Canadian National Anthem blows away the United States of America. I think that we should pivot to another song, maybe God Bless America. I don't think that's going to be a one, but glorious and free. And now that I'm back, okay, in my mom's basement, here it is. There it is, buddy. I know oh, you're geez. waiting for it. There it is. Yep, I got the yep. See you soon. Something nobody needs to see. CBS Sports wagering analyst Tim Doyle. Breaking down the Rookie of the Year race, which has now begun. We're less than 24 hours after the NBA draft, and uh, the Rookie of the Year race is on. Paolo Boncaro is a favorite alongside Jabari Smith, or plus 350. Tim doesn't necessarily like those odds for Boncaro. Uh, he thinks they're a little bit too high. Jaden Ivey, lots of growth potential there, plus 550. And he likes Ben Matherin at plus 1,000. He's a sleeper, Rookie of the Year. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.